We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. All right, Mr. Brax, welcome back, mate. Good to see you. Mate, good to be back, and I'm glad we get to do our sort of two-yearly catch-up on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Like I was saying before the show, um, I mean, who would have predicted back then, you know, that uh, that the world was going to kick off into this pandemic? Hey, it's crazy, mate. I, yeah, you like we would have just, you know, you you if someone explained that to us back then, it would have been this, you know, like sort of you just would have been like, no, that's not that's not possible. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. It's because you. So you were in, yeah. That's well, probably a good segue, I suppose. Um, you were in Canada at the time um, of our last show. So maybe take us through, um, you know, what's been happening um, and then we'll get to the book, obviously. But yeah, like, how have you been spending your time? Yeah, and I, I can give you a bit of a, a, a really quick rundown, I guess, of my life from then till now. Because it's been, I mean, everyone's gone through stuff in COVID and I, I wouldn't say it's been bad, but it's been challenging. It's like uh, the amount of, like, I sort of had moved my life over to Vancouver uh, that was a big thing for me because I'd never lived overseas. Oh, well, I'd traveled and lived, done a gap year apart from that hadn't. So I'd mo- finally made this move to Vancouver. I actually loved it there. Things were going well. Um, the pandemic happened, had to come home prematurely. The visa ended. Um, while all that happened, I was back home and my auntie and uncle both passed away during COVID. And that oh, was sort wow. of the two most important people in the world to me. And Man. in amongst all of this, I had, you know, won the green card lottery. And I had a ticking time frame that if I didn't, I had like a 12 month period to get physically back into America to, to not lose it. So I was sort of back there, got to February this year and had sort of four weeks left to physically get myself over here. So I came over here and um, so, which has been, you know, good. I went to New York and it's been a good experience. But it's also been incredibly hard. And, you know, I've been launching a book, living off savings, building my projects from here and, you know, Half the time I'm thinking, Nick, why why do I make myself so hard? Like I've always been ambitious and I make yeah. my life a lot harder than it needs to be. But <laughs> you know what? It's been a good experience as well. But it's been a roller coaster. And you know, like a lot of people, it's just been like, my God, you know, this is like this is tough <laughs> in a good way, but you know, it's been hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the you know, I think you and I both kind of talk about this idea on our social media that in times of chaos, it's so important to instill certainty and control the things we can control within our lives. And for you to just be back and forth and traveling, you know, it's this, it, I suppose, as you said, it, it is necessary because it, it's, it's for what you want to be doing, but it does create just more chaos and uncertainty and, you know, that dichotomy and having that balance and stability of living in one place, even though it's not what you want to do, it's another thing that you've had to app, you know, kind of, uh, control and, and, and work with. So, you know, I suppose, I suppose you've really had to use some of the mental health tools you always talk about over the past couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. mate. So it, it, it's hard when you don't have a base, you sort of, you, you're constantly thinking, where is home? You know, mm-hmm. where's my base? What's you don't feel centered. And um, I'm big on all the stuff you're just talking about there. I'm so big on, and that is for me, it's the biggest clutch. It's I exercise every single day or, you know, one day off a week, I'll go for a walk on that day and I do, you know, gratitude journaling and all these routines that that's, that's almost my home. You know, my routines <laughs> are my home because, and the things that I do that are for myself and even my work, a lot of the time it's like, okay, I, no matter where I am and what's going on, I can structure my day. I can set my hours I'm going to be working and that I'm going to do these, you know, things that are healthy for me. And that sort of does center you where even when you're like, uh, and I've been in situations um, when I was first in New York and it's happened a lot of times where you're, you know, you don't know the next week where you're going to be living because you're mm. sort of like in short-term situations and, and it's stressful. So sort of doing that. And and then I, I'm, I've started looking at a lot of that as an opportunity to, um, learn to be more present as well rather than because a big thing for me and a lot of people is my mind's always looking into the future and what's going to happen next and even if things are going well what if this happens or or how do i get to that level um so you know really trying to use that to 
uh, bring me back and be centered and be, you know, uh, present. Um, and, and another thing I, I was talking to my psychologist about three months ago about when at the beginning I was really struggling in New York and, um, and I was like, God, oh, this is hard. You know, I'm like, just, it's never ending. I can't find, you know, peace of mind. It's expensive. It's chaotic. I, I don't, you know, it's so competitive. Um, and he sort of reminded me, you know, to look at every situation, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, um, you're going to learn something. And if it's the harder it is, that's going to be, you know, you're going to be learning something really valuable. So embrace that um, and see it as a positive. If things were easy all the time, you wouldn't learn. So, you know, I try and remind myself a lot of those sort of things. Um, sometimes, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just crawl into bed and just cry myself to sleep. <laughs> yeah, the healthy approach. <laughs> but, yeah. but most of the time I try and remind myself that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's hilarious, mate. Literally, yeah. that was me last week. I was... Uh, I just, I just had enough and um, for whatever reason, fish and chips sounded pretty good. And I just yeah. went, I went to town, minimum chips, all to myself, burger, went for it, hated oh, myself yeah. after. I was like, man, I didn't, that was, that was a short term cure there. <laughs> Sometimes you can't help it. <laughs> Sometimes you can't. And, and also it's, you know, like I think, and that's what I'm big in the work I do. And I think probably from what I've seen of what you do as well, it's just, it's being honest and real. And it's like, we're, we're talking about this stuff, but we're not, we don't have all the answers and we're not perfect. It's we're talking about it because we've lived through it and we know what it's like. And we're trying to say, well, how can we, you know, talk about it more? How can we try and everyone find your own, you know, things that work for you. But at the same time, if you're having a bad day. Sometimes that's what I'll do. I'll go and buy, you know, um, bags of chips and dip and, you know, things of bloody diet coke or whatever and just turn the lights off make it pitch black lie in bed watch three movies and gorge myself and fall asleep and 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 you know what like in that moment it actually helps you get out of your head when you are in a in that state so yeah it's like yeah. not the healthiest thing but i think sometimes it's okay to do that kind of thing mate i'm, I'm actually really glad that you said that because um there, there, there's an there's an there's an idea i've spoken to a couple of uh you know mental health advocates counselors psychologists um you know you kind of build up a network you know the more you promote this stuff on on social media and make it your profession as you and i've obviously both done and um i sometimes get the feeling and i know this to be true within my own life and it seems to be similar with other people's lives who are in the field that you know, because we, we know about it, we, we talk about it, you know, we've, we've lived through, we've lived through it and we've practiced some of these tools in times of social distress. Um, some of us seem to neglect the tools and practices that we need ourselves to maintain our own kind of mental health, because, you know, we kind of get into this subconscious idea that, you know, I know this stuff, you know, I need to be there for other people. And, yeah. um, and and it can it can actually have a dramatically negative effect on 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 our ability not only to live but to actually help other people. So it's good to hear that you say, just being honest with yourself. You know, if you need a little bit of pleasure time, you know, <laughs> within context, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you need to just be kind to yourself and 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 come back to your tools, because office, you know, most of the time the difference between good mental health and bad mental health is just that daily practice, you know? So it's good to hear that you yeah. say that, you know, it's, it's something that you're staying on top of as well, because someone who's, who's in the area and who's talking about it and providing that kind of support, you know, you, you might be the last person to give that to yourself. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You might, you, you often can be, but I think it's like, and I'm trying to move even more in that way of just being, you know, more open and honest about things. And I, you know, I don't want to be like the, the last thing I'd want to be seen as, you know, some sort of, person who's trying to be this guru of I've got the answers and blah, blah, blah. I, I'm like, I'm just, I just want to be facilitating and, you know, creating conversation, encouraging other people to be honest. But that's part of the main part of the education is that we're all, there's no such thing as perfect. We've all got issues. The reason that there's a lot of problems is because people feel like we need to be this so-called perfect thing and, you know, put on a front and not be vulnerable. And that's, you know, the, the beauty in life is in, in the vulnerability and in, mm -hmm. in, in not being perfect and, you know, having quirks about you. And the more we can all, you know, share that, it just, it cuts down a lot of the crap and it would make a lot of people happier. It'd simplify a lot of things in life. Oh, mate, 100%. Um, hey, it's it's good that the book's out there now. And um, I, I think even last time we spoke, um, I mean, we speak a lot, but on the podcast, I don't think you had your podcast launch then. So how's the podcast journey been for you, mate, being on the other side of it? Yeah, it's true. So I launched the podcast uh, at the start of COVID pretty much. Um, oh, yeah. 
So it's been, it's been really good. It's sort of um, COVID. That was another thing with COVID, I guess. I sort of had that time where I was back living at my mum and dad's um, and was able to really just, you know, I was locked in a house and had no distractions. So I just really focused and got the podcast launched, signed a book deal, got all this stuff done that I'd wanted to do for a long time, but had been too busy with other stuff. And um, I really love the podcast. Like I, you know, my favorite thing in the world to do is just have, you know, in-depth conversations with people. And yeah. I've always loved going on other people's podcasts. I've loved, you know, in just day-to-day life having these kind of conversations. So once I started it, it was one of those things where I was like, why the hell didn't I do this 10 years ago? But, <laughs> um, but you know what, it was like, yeah, I was just so glad that I actually did it. And, you know, I've loved the whole process of it. And I think the best thing is you're, you're almost forced to meet all these, you know, different interesting people from all over the world um, mm. because, you know, you're having to source new guests every week and it just, it, it's fascinating, you know, you get, and you get to have build a pretty unique um, connection with that person because you're, you know, you're spending one hour really intensely talking about things that a lot of people don't talk, talk about in, you know, day-to-day conversation. So that's what I've really loved about it. It's, um, you know, it's been, uh, one of the most enjoyable projects I've, I've ever done for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's the best, isn't it? And it's, um, exactly, mate. It's, 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 it's time where you and the other person have just dedicated to each other, you know, it's just yeah. go for it. You know, there's, there's no other distraction there. Um, it's, uh, it's great. And, you know, it's, I, I often say to people, I think it's something that everyone should do, whether or not you release it. Um, yeah. especially in a time like this, where social anxiety has been a really big thing for people. I've known it, um, um, with, you know, with, with clients that I've been seeing and time and time again, it's kind of manifesting in different ways. Um, people saying, oh, they have self-worth or confidence issues, or I don't feel like talking to this person anymore. But mm. on the whole, it's a social anxiety thing. You know, when we're all forced to stay at home, it's weird to talk to people again, but podcasting is such a great way to be like, ah, oh, there's a face. Can we go? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. You're just forcing yourself to block out an hour. And, you know, I guess like, and that's the thing, isn't it? Even if it's not COVID, it's pretty rare that people really can just have, have a focused conversation because you might be there with a friend and, you know, you, they're checking their phone they're thinking about this, they're doing that people, you know, it's crazy. And I, I observe it all the time and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I think it is one area that I've gotten a lot better at. Um, I'm trying to be better at, but you know, we're conditioned now to like, be able, to be able to focus for 30 seconds in, in conversation. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> a little bit concerning. Yeah. Not great. <laughs> it's a little concerning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So um, do you have any, do you have any uh, memorable uh, guests? One, one that sticks out to mind and something that the, the listeners can go and have a listen to? Um, yeah. Quite a few that I've really enjoyed. I mean, one of the first ones we did was with this lady, um, Dr. Carmel Harrington, and she's a sleep expert. And I think it was the second or third episode I released, but I, I couldn't believe how much response that one had. Mm. Uh, and that's what the other interesting thing I've found. It's sort of, I've had, cause I've had some sort of, um, I had this actress, Sarah Jeffrey. It was actually an amazing conversation. She's got like 2 million followers. Oh, wow. Um, she's on like the lead actress on Charmed and um, in these Disney films. And I knew her from Vancouver and she, that was one of my favorites as well. She talked about um, how she's got severe OCD and, um, you know, some really deep sort of things and how all her management tell her all the time, don't talk about this stuff. It's going to ruin your career, blah, blah, blah. So she's going against oh. the grain and I thought it was great. But the interesting thing with that was um, I thought that's going to, you know, get so many listeners, but um, the sleep one actually had more because I think yeah. people just, people just aren't sleeping well. They wanted to <laughs> learn how to sleep. <laughs> um, but, you know, like in, I've, I've enjoyed different aspect, aspects of so many. I actually really enjoyed chatting to, um, Manu, the chef, Manu Fidel. Um, He was, I've known him for about 10 years, I think. I was on a a reality show with him years ago. And um, I really enjoyed it because he's just, he's a genuine guy. And I think people didn't realize he had that side to him. And I think that's what happens in the media a lot because he's just so down to earth and so open and talked about, you know, how he had been depressed and all the, you know, stuff ups he's had in his life and, um, I found it, you know, really, really powerful, you mm-hmm. know, having, hearing that. So that, that's again, you know, what I've loved about the podcast, you sort of get these people opening up and, you know, telling you these things that, um, you wouldn't expect to hear from them. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's also kind of like the way that the media, um, not the media media, but the, the, the media form of the podcast actually works. It's, it's unfiltered. 
Um, it's just totally candid, you know, depending on how you run the show, obviously. But um, when you're given an hour, like obviously you and I will be talking for about 50 minutes to an hour or whatever. Um, yeah. Most shows I think are around kind of 20 to 40 minutes or whatever, but even still it's much, much longer than two, three minutes, you know, that you might see before there's an edit on a TV show or whatever. I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing because, you know, that can be really exciting depending on the show, but yeah, you, you, it's obviously that, it's obvious that podcasting gives you a much better indication of who someone really is because, you know, <laughs> the first 50 shows, I, I just remember listening back to them and I was saying, um, a lot, I probably still do it. I was saying a couple more F words, a hell of a lot more. And I still do it now, but it's so much more raw that you really like, Oh, this is, this is who I am. And then this is who the guest really is too. You know? Yeah. You, you get to see that. And it's not such a good point because I've been doing it for, you know, quite a while now. I, I actually, I thought about this before because literally an hour before this, I did a um, live crossover interview on, on the morning show and I haven't uh -huh. done one like that for a while and you got five minutes Yeah, and, yeah. and I was actually, I was struggling because like every question I was like trying to think about it and answer it, you know, like give a proper answer. And then you're, you've got this window and you just, it's like bang, bang, bang. You're like, Whoa, you know, how do I actually like, how do I try and answer this? authentically in this like really, really quick time slot. It's like kind of hard to do. <laughs> Dude, that would be impossible. So Nick, yeah. you got three minutes, mate. So yeah. So tell us about your life story. Uh, tell us the meaning of life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's all the time we have left. For yeah. me, <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Well, mate, I think that's a great segue. Um, so tell us about your book, Move Your Mind. I remember you and I were chatting um, when we were living, uh, we were living back in Melbourne at the time and, we're talking about how the book deals on you move your mind. Um, and did you get it? Did you get the audio done for it in the end? Uh, we haven't yet. So we okay. are, um, we're going to be recording the audio book soon, I think in the next couple of weeks. So yep. it's been launched in Australia. It's like, uh, yeah, I guess you can buy it. You can pre-order overseas. Um, it'll get released overseas in September, but at the moment you can buy it in store or um, on ebook. Um, or order it online, but um, yeah, we are we are doing the audio book soon, which will be um, which will be fun. Yeah, looking forward to doing that. Yeah, it's good. It's interesting. You, I guess yeah. The, the amount of time you don't realize how often you burp. This was the thing that I had with me. Yeah, every time yeah. I'm doing these audio books, I'm like burping 50 times per session. I'm like, what the hell am I eating? Just cans, yeah. and cans, and cans of beans. <laughs> so don't eat, don't eat beans. <laughs> Don't, don't eat beans before you record. But no, what I was thinking about, it's like a lot of content to to record, isn't it? It's like bloody hell. Oh man, it's you crazy. Be exhausted by the end of it. It's it's yeah, it's it's pretty exhausting, but it's a good feeling, you know. It's a it's a great I mean, I use my audio um recordings as like a final edit. Um you right. know, just look at it the last time and go, okay, am I happy with these words and this and, and all this kind of thing? But it's a great yeah. way to kind of finish the the project. You know, it's yeah. a really, it's a really nice feeling. Um, so I, th yeah, I think you'll love it, mate. I think you'll look forward to it. And you got, you got a great vo voice for it anyway. So you'd be good to go. Oh, thank you, man. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be, <laughs> we'll see how we go. Yeah. But no, it'll be good. It'll be good to do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So tell us about the book, mate. Move your mind. So um, what can we expect? Move your mind. I've got it. Here we go. I'll, I'll give you a look hey. at it. There's the, there's the book. Um, Beautiful. So yeah, it, um, yeah, signed the publishing deal during COVID and, um, I guess it's like what we've tried to achieve, which I think we've got across is make combining, making it sort of engaging and, you know, having a bit of a common story through the whole book and, you know, sharing other stories, but also being very practical. Uh, so it's, it's got sort of from beginning to end, it's got the common narrative of my, my story through it. And then I've interviewed different people from like celebrities to, um, you know, grassroots sort of interviews to experts and, um, and then it's broken into four key sections in the middle. So it's, you know, move your mind, which is movement and, um, you know, that, that area, um, for your mental health, uh, still your mind, which is sleep and meditation, mindfulness, you know, all that sort of area, connect your mind. So about connecting with people and also disconnecting, nice. um, and then feed your mind. So, you know, getting feed, feeding, feeding yourself, obviously, but also what do we actually feed our mind? So it's those four sections that are really driven by, by experts and broken into really practical steps and, you know, guiding people to be like, okay, how can we understand this area? How can I then self-identify based on this information, what I could maybe look into that could help me. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final part of the book, sort of giving them a guide of here's how you can actually put this stuff into action. And it's got sort of 
guides to help you create new habits and a whole lot of things. So, so, you know, it's good. In, in short, you know, like I said at the beginning, trying to combine um, giving, sharing stories with being really practical of how, what, how can I actually use this to make a change? Or once I've read it, I might be like, oh, I want to, you know, I'm really struggling with anxiety, open up to that section and, oh, cool. and look at, you know, use that. So you can sort of come back to it as well, which I think is um, really handy for people. Yeah, that's great. Oh, mate, that's really good. Um, yeah, cool. So a couple of things I want to touch on there. So I love the fact that it's that holistic approach and, you know, the, the, the social narrative of mental health now is changing and transitioning to just health, you know, exercise. It's not physical health and mental health. The, the way you feel is a combination of all these things you do physically and mentally that leads to that, that ultimate result. Yeah. So I really like that. I really also love the fact that, um, and I'd love you to touch on this. There's that journalistic approach to it as well, which I didn't realize. Um, so you actually interviewed uh, not only experts, but also people down at the grassroots level. Did you find, and I'm obviously sure you did because you've sectioned it off into four different areas, but what was some of the, um, the similarities that you found in, 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 in different areas. So, you know, experts are saying certain things here, grassroots are saying, because obviously there are things that work no matter who you are across the board. And I just love for you to talk on that a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I guess like there's so many things like that that you're talking about. And I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, what I always talk about is it's like the common sense sort of stuff that um, we all are sort of aware of, but we don't, do so a lot of it comes down to you know making yourself accountable you know being more vulnerable talking about things going and uh seeking help realizing that you can't do everything on your own um having you know having people there to support you um looking at okay well what is it how how am i going to actually implement this change what am i going to do what are the a lot of it came back to that stuff of whatever you know no matter who the expert was or um what the area is, whether it's exercise or what you eat or whatever, a lot of it just comes down again, you know, common sense, but coming down to like balance doing, not, not doing things like sort of um, on an extreme level, but doing it regularly, you know, small yeah. things every day, you know, it might be um, five minutes of something every day. That's, that's a lot better than, you know, doing two hours one day and then not doing it again for, you know, two weeks. So a lot of those sort of learnings came across in it. Um, and then, you know, in a lot of the stories, you know, that I, with the interviews, it was, um, you know, there's a lot of commonalities as well in people sharing their own stories and what you hear from them and the sort of takeaways. So yeah, it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it is, it is really interesting. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I love counseling, I think, because you just, <laughs> everyone starts off, I think in, in everyone's mental health journey, I know this is the case for me as well. And, you know, I know you and I've discussed this where it's like, you feel it's like, this is, is this only me? Is this like, am, am I only one dealing with this? Very quickly you learn that we're all, we're all struggling with the same kind of stuff. You know, when it all boils down to the fundamental principle, we're all trying to just figure it out. Um, so it's great that you were able to notice some, you know, commonalities and similarities, you know, across your research. Yeah, it actually reminds me of another thing that I sort of noticed through doing it because I interviewed, um, again, you know, like that actress, Sarah Jeffrey, a couple of other, well-known actresses, people who've achieved on a really high level. Mm. And, um, you know, you notice that kind of thing where once you drill down with these people, their view of themselves is no different than the view of the person who, um, you know, is you're doing it like your everyday job and having their own struggles. Like everyone, yeah. like you sort of move up different so-called levels or on an external level, I guess you're on these levels, but what the actual experience of that person no matter you know where what you're doing or where you are, it's it's basically similar in different ways for everyone, and that's what you sort of see. And it's like oh, you know, and, and it gives you comfort because then it makes you think, yeah. hang, like basically it boils down to realizing that if you can't find a way to just be, you know, have some peace of mind with where you're at in life right now and enjoy that process, you're never going to be happy. You know, you're not going to be happy if you achieve all these crazy goals and, you know, become rich and famous or whatever. Like yeah. if you can't find a way to find that peace of mind now, um, it won't come when all these external things, you know, happen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mate, absolutely. <clears throat> did, did you find, did you find that writing about your journey for the book was, was therapeutic <clears throat> as well? Because I know you've, I know you've spoken a lot about, and we spoke about your journey um, on our, on the first episode we did, but how, how was that different when you were actually writing it and, and, um, narrativizing it and putting it into coherent sentences. Did you notice the difference at all? 
Yeah, I've spoken about it, I guess, for, you know, 12 years or something and a lot. So I was I was definitely comfortable doing that, but it, it, it was a different experience because you're sort of really drilling down on things. Things are coming up um, that you forgot about, you know. Yeah. And I so, so in that way, it sort of was therapeutic and it was at times, you know, it's kind of exhausting as well because... Um, and just writing in general, you know, like I've never, I've never done a book before and, you know, writing like 5,000 words a week and sitting there to, you know, consistently doing it's tough. You know, I've got so much respect for <laughs> what you've done and what other people are doing, you know, writing books. It's not, not easy. Um, but at the same time, I love the process and I mm. loved, um, I loved having to, having that goal to, to do it and having to sit there and, you know, seeing what came up and um, yeah, it definitely did make me, think about different things and, um, you know, go back to, um, t- times that I yeah had probably forgotten about or, um, you know, compartmentalized. Yeah. Do you mind sharing some of those times or just, just be interested? Yeah, sure. So it was, I mean, most of it was stuff that I've already talked about, but I mean, there were things that came up where, um, I mean, I, I it goes back to a long way to my backstory, but I grew up, you know, being, um, having OCD while well, still, you know, managing it now, but, um, being compulsive about training in sport and exercising seven hours a day and, you know, doing all these crazy things that, that I've talked about a little bit, but I really, when I was going into that and detailing it in the book, I realized I still, you know, feel a level of shame about some of those things and things came up with sort of, um, eating. And, you know, at one point I was, I think when I was, um, would have been like 11 or 12, it was borderline anorexic you know not not quite at that level but I was you know limiting the food I'd eat um I uh just felt you know there were the there was an eating disorder and um that was something I publicly didn't talk about and I think it was because I and even now talking about it I feel embarrassed and a bit ashamed about it but it brought brought up things like that where I realized okay there's still things you know that are um that I need to dig deeper to to try and and deal with you know that Mm. you even though you've talked about it so much. So, you know, that, that was interesting. It makes you realize that, um, you know, no matter how much you think you've sort of dealt with your past or, you know, become comfortable talking about it, there's, there's often still, you know, a way to go. Oh man, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it hits home for me as well because OCD is something that I, um, you know, I have to work through when I recently had a, um, pretty intense episode actually again. Um, but, you know, I often say that OCD is the, it's the shame disorder, man. You know, shame is so inextricably linked with obsessive compulsive disorder because you have these obsessive ways of thinking. And for Mm. some people, like you mentioned as well, it can also lead to excessive um, physical compulsions and obsessive Mm. physical compulsions as a way to mediate the intense fear or disgust that you feel about whatever it is. Um, And as a result of that, you know, you can kind of see yourself acting this stuff out, but you feel very ashamed about doing it, but it's a, it's an unfortunate, um, it's an unfortunate rabbit hole to lose yourself in because not doing it makes you incredibly scared, but Mm. doing it, it, it deals with the fear, but then exacerbates the shame, you know? So I really appreciate you talking about that. Yeah. Appreciate it, mate. Yeah. But no, like it's, um, I guess like exactly what you're saying, you know, and it is, it's like something that needs to be talked about more. And I think OCD is another one of those issues. And again, going back to Sarah, who, um, you know, cause I just loved all the stuff she talks about and what she's doing in that, in that area, Sarah Jeffrey is her name in in the book um, and on my podcast. But um, you know, she talks about that with, that with OCD, that there's actually not enough education about it. And it gets used in a very, um, you know, throw around sort of way, like someone will be, having one of those, you know, you'll be like, Oh my, I've, I've, I've just had OCD with, you know, this thing today or that thing, not understanding what OCD actually is. And mm. it's not, not the person's fault for saying it in that way, but we're not taught what it actually is. And then how to, how to understand it, how to deal with it, you know? And I know in my growing up, when I was going through all of those issues, I had no idea what the hell was going on and how, you know, there wasn't an education about it to know how do I deal with this? It was just compulsion and you just accept it, I guess, at, at that time when you don't have that self-awareness. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going through that same thing where they just don't know why they're doing it, but they continue doing it and they don't know how to, how to change it or even what, what it is. So it's, um, yeah. you know, like, like so many things that we, we, you know, we need more, more education in it. 
Yeah, but I mean, but even even I mean, not just uh, you know civilians. It's 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 a uh, clinicians, counselors, psychologists need to understand more about what it is as well. You know, my um, yep. education from a professional setting, and I was studying counselling. You know, OCD was. It, you know, it was really only spoken about from that cleanliness perspective. And I'm not taking right, away anything right. from those who struggle with that cleanliness aspect, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a much broader um, disorder. And there's obviously a spectrum with it as there is with, with all forms of, of mental health disorders, um, you know, but it's not just compulsive behaviors as well. It's, um, it's very much tied up with this, this uh, intrusive thought process um, it's not necessarily just about disgust. Um, it's about a whole range of issues, you know, and um, yeah, so I, I do totally agree totally. with you yeah. that um, there needs to be more education there. But again, then I was thinking, you know, it's not necessarily anyone's fault because mental health and psychology in general is, is an emerging field as we learn more about, you know, some of the stuff you're doing, opening up, being more vulnerable, hearing other people's stories creates, it's, it's really great from both the, the client and the clinician's perspective, because we can learn more about what's going on as well as hearing about um, what some, some of the science is saying. So, you know, um, broad way to finish my rant here, but social yeah. media is a great way <laughs> to learn. <laughs> yeah. And it, it is, you know, it's- as many as much negatives as there are with it, it's a good way to learn as well. So it's like got got a lot of positives about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, mate, it's great. It's great to hear that um, you know you you move through that and you put out some of this book. I'm really keen to actually read this book. Um, so take us through some of the launching. Then, what was it like to to launch a book? It's something I've never done because I went through the um, you know the the self publishing route. But what's the uh, what's the media tour been like for you, mate? Yeah, so it's it just started. Um, where it launched a week ago in Australia, so it's been, um, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been sort of stressful leading up to it because I was originally, since I came over here, I was going to be coming back to Australia in um, sort of June, July, and be back for a while and be there for the launch of it. And um, I intended on doing it until about three weeks ago, and had a flight booked that got cancelled at the last minute. Then all the new oh, yeah. restrictions, the more severe ones, came in place. So. Um, and you know, flight flights were becoming sort of ten thousand dollars for a one way ticket, and then you got to quarantine, pay another three thousand dollars. So um, it got to a point where it just was not ten, not worth it. Like, and yeah. and then you know, you get there, and I guess as it's panned out, I've probably been fortunate. I didn't go back because um, would have been just locked away anyway. So um, we've sort of with the we've got a PR company working with us and been planning a lot of it like you have to with COVID anyway, with, with in mind that, you know, who knows if we'll be able to do anything physically anyway. Uh, so yeah, it's been, um, yeah, just did an interview on, um, the morning channel seven morning show before and had a thing in the paper last week. And we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming up now that we've kicked it off and, you know, going on as many other people's podcasts as I can and just looking at, you know, as many different things as we can sort of do to, um, to get it out there. Um, Yeah. And you know, get the word out there. And um, I mean, that's been the other hard thing with it. It's in it's in a whole. It's in like four hundred bookstores um, now, but four four states in Australia are closed. So <laughs> you know, we've launched it, but people can't walk into a bookstore to get it. So yeah. I mean, that'll change. But it's like it is a weird thing. <laughs> oh man, it's the weirdest time to be launching a book. You know, so we- <laughs> so- it's a weird time in general, but yeah, especially yeah. for a book. I mean, I suppose we have Kindles and, you know, we can do um, the audio version, like you said, when you're, you're going to be doing that. So not all hope is lost, but um, no. it is a weird time, hey? <laughs> it's a weird time for it. But yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. I think people are used to launching and doing things remotely now. So most of it's okay, but it's um, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely unusual. Yeah. Do you, um, when you're doing all these interviews – are they more or less asking you the same thing or like did, did, does any time, does anyone throw like a curveball at you or? Uh, occasion, no, normally it's pretty similar sort of stuff. Um, sometimes as a couple, I mean, a lot of them, you know, will focus the media around stuff from my past and things that, uh, yeah, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, how the media works, which it's like, okay, you know, it's not ideal, but whatever. It's like, so you're not- Steve Brax's son, hey? Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's a well, nice I've also thing. done some stuff myself. Done a few other things, but yeah. that's a good thing about being in America. No one, no one knows who my family is. So like, you know, I don't know who your dad is. True. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, yeah, most of it's been, 
probably the the biggest curveball is that you know you do an interview and you don't know what they're going to headline it or you know what mm-hmm. how they're going to angle it and you know like you're saying you know it'll be something about my dad or a crash that happened a car crash from you know 14 years ago which is talked about in the book but the book isn't you know a um bi- biography on on me it's mm-hmm. got my story detailed in it because it paints a picture but it's it's you know it's it's a mental health book to interview other people and give a overview on it so a lot of it will end up focusing on you know whatever's gonna um probably drive more people to read an article because the shock value or whatever man that's actually really interesting right <laughs> that's something i didn't ask you about i mean you know we've spoken a lot we're pretty good pretty friendly but i've never yeah. actually um asked you that so like growing up in the public you know and then and then moving through that i mean we see this happening all the time obviously you know it's by no means a similar thing, but what happened with Tex Walker and, you know, you know, saying that, that racist thing, whatever it is, but just being in, in public and, and doing something that obviously society feels is, is, is not the best thing. When you, when you are moving through that, I mean, we spoke about shame before, man, you know, mm. what, what mm. was that like for you? And did you, did you feel you had to kind of just be, spend time with yourself on what was it like moving through, through that? Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, it like definitely, is a challenging thing um being that young and being in the media and not knowing how to navigate it and uh probably growing up from a very young age having well having a well-known father and the family being known and you sort of spend a lot of your I spend a lot of my adolescence being known as the son of this person and and it 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 does this weird thing to your psychology and you start thinking you're you've almost got two identities and you're and you and it, there's this fuel this sort of fire, sorry, inside me that I need to prove myself and I need to become Nick Brax, not the son of this person. How yep. can I do that? I need to do something extreme, which probably for how I am, like I, you know, as I'm wired in a way that I've got that mind. You know, I think that is a biological thing because I remember being a very young kid and thinking differently and being, yep. you know, taking everything to the extreme. And I've got so many early examples of that. But I think the com- for me, the combination of having that sort of mentality where I probably would have had issues with it and gone, you know, that way anyway, combined with the well-known father being in the media, all that stuff of, okay, now I've like got, you know, twice or probably not twice, like five, 10 times of the motivation to yeah. prove myself. Cause I have to. Um, and sort of, sort of, it became unhealthy. Uh, so it really drove a lot. Of, and it's just, it's a complicated thing and you see it, not 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 only just in people in the public eye, but it's just it's a very common thing with anyone that's got successful parents. Mm. Uh, it for the kids, it it's often this very tricky thing to navigate and find. Okay, how do I find my own identity? How do I find my own field to go into? How do I feel secure and comfortable and you know confident and you know proud of myself in what I'm doing? Because the the fallback thing can be no matter what I do is not good enough because it doesn't match up to what my parents did on, yeah. on, on that public level. Um, so then you've got to start really. So I think it had all those negatives, but then the thing I've become, you know, more and more aware about is I think if I didn't have all that stuff happen, I wouldn't have uh, gone on the path I've gone on. I wouldn't have had to question things. I wouldn't have had to, you know, think deeply about things. I wouldn't have had to really look at what are my values? What do I stand for? Who do I want to be? What do I really care about? Where are, all of these other holes in, you know, society. Um, so it sort of made all of that stuff happen, which I think that's a gift in itself. So it's sort of, mm-hmm. and, and this is what I believe in life. There's no, again, no perfect, um, something, no matter what we do is going to come at a cost either of, you know, time of sacrifice of pain of whatever it is. So that, that was a big cost for me, but then it gave me all these other really rich sort of things that I've, you know, experienced, which I always try and remind myself that with whatever I'm doing, if I'm in New York struggling, it's at a cost of your comfort of your, you know, finances of this, that, and the other, but it's bringing about these amazing opportunities that I wouldn't get back home. Um, and yeah, back home yeah. would have, you know, so I think it's like, yeah, like I said, it's something I try and, you know, think about a lot because um, that's just life. You know, we can't, we can't have everything. Yeah, I actually think that's a really healthy way of looking at it, mate, as well. And, you know, some, some people are, are big on this idea of, you know, well, well what was it a lesson or, or a blessing, you know, and that's a positive thing to, to take away from it, you know, and there are so many examples of how we could, you know, do that with your life. It's like, 
you know, cause you're now using your, um, fame, I suppose, and being in the public eye as a, as a way to serve the public, which is just brilliant, mate, as well, you know, but the, the, you've taken on to a next step in saying everything in life is is both good and bad, you know, which ultimately comes down to being able to balance the two, you know, which, which is that, I think is so healthy because yeah. you can so easily get lost in this. It's It's come out as a negative and then lose yourself down there or it's come out just as a positive. So I have to keep holding on to this idea of it being positive. You know, where it's actually it's it's probably a little bit more in the middle. Exactly. Everything's in the middle. And and you know, we're not we're not taught that. We're sort of taught that it's, you know, it's this mechanical view of this is what success looks like. This is how you you do things. If you don't do that, then that's not successful. And it's like, well, no, that's big, you know, and people don't question it because we're not taught the most important thing I believe, which is, you know, like we're not taught how to, how to critically think. We're not taught how to be more self-aware, communicate, understand relationships, you know, things that are yeah. absolutely just critical to day-to-day life. And we're not, we're not taught about it. Um, if you are, if you do have that understanding, then it's pretty hard not to realize that there's no better or worse or right or wrong. Everything's going to every, you know, that that's the thing. Life's life's complicated and there's lots of layers to it. And it's about, finding within that not what's the right or wrong or perfect thing to do what's what's best for me you know mm. which is a hard thing to do you know how do you look at that and s- stay true to that when you're in a world where um all you have to do is you know wake up in the morning and open your phone and you're told what you should you, you're made to think what you should do yeah even yeah. if you are happy with yourself so it's pretty you got to be very very strong in your you know your core values and what you stand for and you know revert back to that every time you question things Oh man, absolutely. Um, I, th- I actually think that's a, it's a brilliant way to, to, to end the show, mate. It, it is so true. And you know, the, the world we live in now is, uh, you know, every little thing is just demanding our attention, you know? Yeah. So, um, but it is a skill, like you said, you know, can you, can you find these habits to, you know, my phone's over there for the first hour when I wake up or start a podcast. So it's just you and the person for, for the next hour or whatever it is and, mm. and put some of the, the tools and, and practices that, you know, I'm sure you've outlined in the book, mate. So um, I've got I've got a bit of a reading list ahead of me, but uh, I've got to get into Move Your Mind because it'll be fun to read. Yeah, and no, I would love to see what you think, mate. And um, yeah, thank you for having me on here again. It's always good to chat to you. And um, I'll have to get you on my podcast at some point as well. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I feel a bit strange. I've done, I reckon I've done about 450 episodes now and I've, I've probably done about 10 or 15 on the opposite side. And I... <laughs> I always revert to asking questions again because I just feel strange when I'm like, so tell us about your life story. Well, what makes you <laughs> want to know? <laughs> I, don't want to I know it. it must be, if you've been doing it for that long, yeah, it would be it would be weird going on. The end, yeah. It's a bit bizarre. I'm always up for the challenge, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well, mate, so good to so good to hear your voice. So good to uh, catch up again. And um, yeah, mate, when you're next in town, it'd be good to grab a beer because uh, it's been a while. <laughs> It's been a while, mate. So yeah, definitely. When I'm back there, God knows when it will be, but when, yeah. when, when I am back, yeah, we'll have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, just quickly, uh, in order to get the book um, online, uh, where can people go? So they, you can go to my website. So nickbrax.com. That'll come up with all the links. Otherwise you can go to Booktopia and look up Move Your Mind or type in Move Your Mind, Nick Brax. Or if you go on Amazon, uh, you can find it as well. If you're overseas, you'll need to go on Amazon to to purchase it online. So yeah, that's where okay. you can go. Cool. Brilliant. And you're Nick Brax, Nick underscore Brax on Instagram. On Instagram, just Nick Brax. Just yep. Nick Brax. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Guys, check him out. And uh, yeah, I can't, I was about to say, read the book. It's great. I haven't read it, obviously. I want to be authentic <laughs> here. When I do, I'll, I'll, I'll be mentioning it. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, mate. No, thank you so much. Beautiful. Guys, thanks so much for listening. Uh, speak to you next week. Bye.